الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Insha'Allah in a continuation for the topic of knowledge Insha'Allah tonight will be entitled The Etiquette and the Responsibility of Dialogue. And we will seek to look at the importance of which someone has as a representative of the school of Ahl al-Bayt and how he should have dialogue with people within other sects in Islam, people of other religions within the world, atheists, and above all, and the most important, tonight's topic will be dialogue between one another. Especially looking at the image or the circle which is tashayyur, as in how is it we should go about talking with one another. So we may have differences within maraja, differences within particular ideology fields, whether it be tatbir, whether it be la'na, whether it be anything that we may look at to be very controversial. How is it that we should go about having dialogue? How is it that we should tell the other person our specific view on a particular issue and how we must respect the opposition's view. Now inshallah to discuss the topic for tonight, please help me in starting with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The issue of dialogue is one of the most important because when you find that on the first level, when we say lana al-sinatikum, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you carry yourself, the way you associate with people from the same gender and people with the opposite gender, will give a great indication of your faith, a great indication of who you are, what your moral values are, your characteristics and your personality. And that would be the first level in which you will gain people towards the message of Ahlul Bayt, the message of Islam. Now the second barrier or the second stage in which comes forth or comes down to once you've gained particular person's attention by your actions, by your movements, is the speech process. The way you present Islam verbally. Therefore that's what is important in the topic for tonight. As we would like to look at how to go about talking, how is it we should go about discussing the religion of Islam and how not to discuss the religion of Islam. Now let's look at it first and foremost from a religious perspective. As in, let's look at it from our Imams. And remember, we said in the first instance, But then when your tongue is tested, let's say, before we go, on, go up and discuss interfaith dialogue, dialogue with one, within one another, on a very basic level and a humanitarian level, Let's say, let's take the stuff that, that is haram. Let's say, for example, the ghiba, the namime, these kind of issues. How should we go about it? Because we always fall into the trap of being associated or being in a particular group of people in which will be discussed a particular person in a negative manner or a namime that will be negative, whether it be positive or negative. Remember, the namime is haram, just as ghiba is haram. Let's look at it and how the imams looked at, look at it. What happened when someone comes to the Imam to do an amime? Let's look at the reply of Ali ibn Abi Talib. As in someone comes forth, because you remember there's two sides. One side is the person that's actually saying the ghiba or the namime. However, you wouldn't have that person if you didn't have an E to listen to him. So the second player or the second person that has a vital role is the person that's being told and how their reaction is. Now let's look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. A person comes to Ali ibn Abi Talib and he says what? He said, such and such person has said something ill about you. Such and such person has said something ill about you. Look at the reply of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He's heard the namima. 
He looks at the person. He says, we will look into, if you want, what you have said. We will look into it. He says, you have three options now. He says, what's my options? He says, if you're truthful in what you have said, we will make sure that you are lowered in our eyes. Your rank will be lowered. You will be nothing towards us. He says, why? He says, because you've done an act which Allah dis is displeasing Allah. It's namimah. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. He says, that's the first. He says, what's my second option? He says, if you are lying, we will prosecute you. Because that's a lie. He says, what's my third option? He says that you seek forgiveness and we will forgive you. He says, oh, oh Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I seek forgiveness. He says, go. Look at that. Now we find it nowadays. How can we say to ourselves, someone comes to us and says something. Fulan says such and such about you. Fulan, you'll begin to curse that Fulan. You will go find out that Fulan, what did they actually say? What drove them to say that? Who else says this particular issue about you? Look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib says what? What did we say? If you're truthful, we will lower you. If you've lied, we'll prosecute you. And if you seek forgiveness, we'll forgive you. That's the issue. That's within one another. Giving us the idea of dialogue. Dialogue, if you take the root word, in the Latin language, it literally means to see in the other person's point of view or the other person's spectacles. So when you come towards a dialogue, remember to have an open mind. That's the first reference. To have an open mind is to actually look at what the other person is saying. And then you can deliver that which you have. If in a particular instance of dialogue we have one issue, or one person screaming at another, who is going to be learning what? There's no level of respect between the two. There's no understanding. Alama Tabtabai once had a debate with a Christian man, a French Christian man, and it's a massive book, a beautiful book, entitled a Shia. Now this book, I, I myself, I looked at the first two pages and I did the dictionary with me. That's, that's the depth of knowledge that was discussed. But let's look at how they started this discussion. Remember, one of our great ulama against a Christian man. How did they start off? Alama Tabtabai takes off his imamah, puts it down. He looks at the Christian man and says, don't think that I'm a scholar or whatever it may be, or you may be scared of me, intimidated. He says, no, let's have a di dialogue like two human beings. But not just any normal human beings. We want to show our level of respect to one another. He says, do not be intimidated. He takes off his imam and puts it down. He says, let's have a human being talk to another human being. Let's have our morals up high and have a dialogue in which we do not disrespect one another. Let's provide facts and figures in which we can look at this particular issue that we're discussing in depth. That's the dialogue. Another Imam, you remember, who's ever seen the series for Imam Rada alayhi afdal salati was salam? The series, tw I think 30 CDs, in, in which the, I think the 25th CD looks into the Munavara, where Al Ma'mun brings forth the best of the best in the lands, the highest ranking atheists, the highest ranking Christians, the highest ranking Jews at the time. To see, is this really the son or the grandson of the Prophet of Islam? Does he say that he has the knowledge in which he has? So he comes forth. The people told Imam Rada alayhi afdal salatu wa salam, he says, if you go towards this and you attain victory, you will have written your doom because the mamun will kill you. However, if you don't go, no one will know the position of the Ahlul Bayt. So he goes. Every single word that comes out of the Imam's mouth in that munadhara is something we, we need to learn. It's something we need to read. It's something we need to look at when we're having dialogue with the other schools of thought and in the other sects. As an example, let's look at the Christian and the atheists. And then I'll, I'll move on, inshallah, to look at interracial dialogue. He goes at the Christian man, and the Christian man comes forth. He was the first to approach the Imam. And he looks at him and he says to the Imam, he says, what do you say? 
What do you say about your prophet in comparison to ours? Why do you think that your prophet is the best in comparison to ours? Look at the imam, look at how he replies. Because remember, knowledge and application, the previous nights. Who knows what they are, how they think, what they believe in. So the imam uses it to his advantage. He narrows down the Christian in a particular corner. Look at the reply of the imam. He could have said anything. He could have said anything from the Quran. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullah. He says to the Christian man, he says, We believe that our prophet is the greatest of prophets. The Christian man says, why is he the greatest of prophets? He says, because he prayed the most. That's the only thing he says at the start. He says, because he prayed the most. Then the Christian man, he speaks out. He says, how dare you say such a thing? He says, why? What have I said? He says, how can you say that anyone prayed more than our Lord, Jesus Christ, he says. How can you say that? The Imam's already got him in a corner. What was his reply? He says, if you say that he is your Lord, can you, uh, can you answer me and tell me who is he praying towards? Look at that position. He narrows him down and says, can you tell me, if he is your Lord, if he is your God, why is it that he's praying? Why is he prostrating? If he is your Lord, person be quiet, goes back. Another person comes forth, he answers and he answers. and he An atheist comes. By the name of, I believe, Amran al sabi if I'm not mistaken. And he comes towards the Imam and he, and he speaks to the Imam. And he begins to attack the Imam. And he says, tell me about God. And this is something, when we look at Tawheed, this is, it's so detailed, the reply of the Imam, that we can take it into different particular sections and analyze every single wording of the Imam. Look at how he replies. Look at how he distinctly gives us the image which is Tawheed. The atheist tells him, he says, tell me about your Lord. And Im the Imam begins to tell him. He is known through his asma. This is other his characteristics. Then he says a question. He says, are we in Allah or is Allah in us? Look at that. Think about it. Actually, like, let's comprehend this. He asks a question. Are we as creation created inside something which is the Almighty? Or is Allah inside us? Is he, is he everywhere within us? He asks this to the Imam and everyone begins to ask themselves. He says, yes, that's true. Are we in Allah? Is Allah in us? What's going on? We can't comprehend it. Look at the reply of the Imam. He looks at the man. He says, tell me about the mirror. Tell me about the mirror. He says, what do you want to know about the mirror? He says, are you in the mirror or is the mirror in you? Look at that detail. Are you in the mirror or is the mirror or are you in the mirror or is the mirror in you? Because you can see yourself. It's a reflection that we see. We're not in the mirror. The mirror is not in us, but we can see ourselves, isn't it? The person begins to come up with arguments and the Imam and everyone knew that the Imam already had him. There's a ring on his finger. And that's imagine just that in itself, in the aspect of tawheed. That we can analyze that Allah's reflections, if you look at the mirror images, of Allah's mercy, Allah's justice, the ethics that Allah wants. Who is Allah's mirror images on earth that he wants? Except for Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. That's, that's the beauty of it. When we look at perfection, it's different from looking at imperfection. When you have two glasses in front of you, and this is, the, this is the idea of role models, when we have to take from role models how to act and react in certain situations. When we have the perfection, let's say a clear gla glass of water, a clear glass of water, not a speck in it, perfect. Allah says that water and the effect of water should be the effect of the mu'mineen. It purifies all that around them. And that's intertwined with wudu, intertwined how you should be feeling in wudu, how you should be purified in a thought process when making wudu, before even making it. The mu'min is like water. Now imagine our imams, our ma'sumin, clear water. That's our role models. The role models of other schools of thought, the role models of other sects, they say to themselves, yes, it's water. We tell them they have such and such mistake. 
They have committed this atrocity. They have committed this particular act of injustice, this act of kufr. They said it's okay, overall they're good people. Now I want to ask you, if you have a clear cup of water, nothing in it, and you have a cup of water that you put a bit of dirt in, let it be one grain of dirt. When you mix it, doesn't it become cloudy? Therefore, it's not clear anymore, is it? It doesn't show you the path to Allah as clear as the clear one, does it? When the radio, you open it, the closer you are to the frequency, the more clear it becomes, isn't it? The further you are, the more shaky, the less you know. The more the things become appearing to us, as half balanced, not the complete picture. We hear one word and another word is very shaky. Another word shaky, we hear another word out of context. The Imams are always on the correct frequency. The Imams are that clear cup of water. If we hold on to them, we are holding on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we know such people, when we look at their ethics, we look at how they acted in society, how they acted and reacted within one another. When they're angered, when they're happy, when they're in a state of sorrow, when they're in a state of happiness, everything was perfection. When they're happy, we can see that they used to give out. When they were in a state of oppression, when they didn't have anything to give, they would even give from themselves. They'd give, whether it be dua, whether it be, how did the Qur'an write down in a verse in the Holy Qur'an when they fasted for three days without food or water and they gave uh, three people that came towards their doorstep knocking and they had nothing to eat, they gave everything that they had towards them when they were oppressed. Imam Zain al-Abideen, after his father was murdered, he finds a person clinging onto the Kaaba, crying and crying and he goes towards him. He says, what's wrong? He says, Allah will never forgive me. He says, what's the matter? He says, I was one of the people that went out and killed Imam Hussein. Let's look at this. Because we can analyze how they're always perfect, whether they've been oppressed, whether they're happy, whether they're sad. From this particular instance. He goes towards him. He says, what's wrong? He says, no, Allah will never forgive me. Why? Because I've killed or I have... Being amongst the people that have killed Imam Hussein, he says, I will let you know. Look at the reply of the Imam. He says, I will let you know of something to do that Allah will forgive you your sins. And he says, what is it? He says, pray Salatul Ghufayla. He says, what's that? Imam teaches him. He says, Salatul Ghufayla is two rak'at. The first rak'at is Alhamd. And you recite from the Quran. And the second rak'at also. And you recite from the Holy Quran. Two rak'at, very simple. One take, five minutes. Whether noon in the first, in the first rak'at, very five minutes. And he says, "I'll give you this. I have gifted you this. You have killed my father, but I will give you this information, because we are from the household that are a mercy." He gives him this particular salat. Sayyidah Zainab looks at him, he says, she says to him, why have you given him this? They've killed your father. He says, I am a hujjah on this earth. When someone asks through me, I give him nothing but perfection. I give him what Allah has entrusted me. But he replies by saying what? He says, Allah will not give him the blessing, the tawfiq to pray these two rak'at. Because of his actions. That's what I want to get at. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the month of Ramadan, He gives us before it two months to prepare for Ramadan. The month of istighfar and the month of charity. The month in which we can account for our sins and replenish them. So that when we come to the month of blessing, which is Ramadan, there's no actions that will guard us. That will not allow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take our a'mal like that person that wasn't given the tawfiq to pray those two rak'at for ghufayla between Maghrib and Isha. We don't want ourselves to fall under that trap. 
That's why we have to ask Allah first and foremost for forgiveness for our sins. Give from what Allah has given us towards those that have nothing. So that Allah may forgive us if we have sins. And on the final level, when we do a'mal, we make sure when we do it with the right hand, our left hand doesn't know. When we pray Salat al-Layl, you don't come the next morning and you tell everyone, well, I'm thirsty. Why are you thirsty? Haven't you had suhoor? He says, no, I've been in Salat al-Layl all night and I've, I've missed suhoor. Don't, you don't, in that particular instance. Make sure whatever you do, whether it be charity, whether it be Salah, Quran, you do it with your right hand, your left hand doesn't know. Make sure you do everything in secret. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will appreciate it more. Why do you think Salat al-Layl has such a high significance? Because you do it when no one is watching, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't have lengthy ruku's and sujoods while everyone is watching. There's a story about a scholar that was in a mosque, he heard the door open. So he thought to himself, that someone's come in, I must make sure that my salah is perfect. So he extends his ruku. He extends his sujood, makes sure his bismillah is heard throughout the mosque, it echoes. He finishes, he does the taslim, right, left. He does the sajjat al-shukr, and he's thinking to himself, this person is going to think, wow, what a scholar. He looks around and he finds out that a cat has made its way into the mosque. He's thinking to himself, what have I done? Give us an idea that what? Look at the concept of riya. Look at the concept which we have to learn that when someone is watching, we become elevated. How about when the Lord that created you is watching? When the Lord that created you is the one that will be accounting and you will be accountable. And inshallah, in the, in the nights of Layl Qadr, when Ali ibn Abi Talib was struck, we want to talk about Salat, its importance, its application, and its effect through the genes. That will follow. And inshallah, I end on this manner. I end on this note, and inshallah, this brings us to the conclusion for the series of knowledge for this Ramadan, inshallah, and we'll continue with a new series tomorrow. And we pray to Allah on this note that He wipes out the sins which hold us back from gaining the rewards of, of Ramadan, that He wipes the sins in which hold our du'as, hold our a'mal, hold our salat from reaching the roof. And may Allah accept all the du'as and the a'mal and the siyam and the salat and the Qur'an of everyone here. With the blessed Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha, but before it, three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.